So in this third video on data management, we're going to look at the data lifecycle's last stages that are really from the perspective of the data user. So that really begins with data discovery. So how do you find the data sources you needed? So I, when I first started teaching this class, I used to joke that you, know, you can't just Google for different types of data, that you really need to know the different repositories out there. Uh, you know, that said, uh, since then, data, Google, Google actually has uh, created a, a, an actual scientific data search capacity. But even so, uh, you know, it's still a you know, young service and, and a lot of data exists out there within the, the archives and, and systems of a lot of different agencies and organizations. And part of uh, knowing a discipline is, is knowing uh, what data exists in different areas and, and where to find it. And how to access it. And those are really, you know, can often be real bottlenecks uh, to someone trying to work with data. Is, is just knowing what out, what is out there and how to find it. Uh, once we know where the data is, we need to know how to get it. Um, and and sometimes that will be as simpler as simple as using a web browser to download data. Uh, that's something that generally works for for low volume data and for data that doesn't uh, change very often. Uh, but it should also be note that there's a lot of tools that allow you within code to access data uh, in a kind of more machine-to-machine -machine way. It, and one of those is that, that you know, some data files, such as uh, CSV files and text files, can actually be opened uh, directly through the web rather than having to download those files locally. So here's an example of using read CSV, a function we've talked about before, uh, to read a, a CSV file right off of Google's server from its Flutrend project. And this skip 11 is just because there's 11, year, 11 rows of header data that needs to be skipped before the actual data. Uh, increasingly, uh, within R and other uh, software libraries out there, like uh, languages out there like Python, there's more and more uh, packages that help us deal with specific types of data and databases, um, really customized tools for specific types of data access. Uh, and I think what we're seeing really a lot of uh, these days are what's called APIs, application programming interfaces, which are uh, essentially uh, ways to access uh, using code uh, data through uh, URLs uh, like this one, that where you have the ability to kind of combine, you know, add variables and, and search criteria into uh, a URL, but a URL that's designed for machine to machine communication rather than to be human readable, it returns some kind of raw data. Uh, and then there's some older tools such as wget and curl, which are kind of command line utilities that can often scrape uh, large amounts of data off the web, even if uh, those websites weren't necessarily designed uh, for, for uh, you know, getting data off them. Uh, the other thing we're seeing a lot more of these days is the idea of instead of downloading data, of moving your analysis and your computation to where the data is. Uh, a great example of that in, in this figure is, is kind of how Google Earth Engine works. So this is a, a web service that Google runs where you can do a lot of remote sensing and GIS analysis where you bring uh, the analysis you want to do often in terms of, of Python scripts uh, to their server through a, you know, a graphical window that you know, is, is somewhat reminiscent of what we see in our studio, but more focused uh, from a mapping perspective. Um, and they're, you're operating on data that's on the Google server. So rather than downloading potentially petabytes of data off of, say, NASA's servers, you, you move your compute to Google servers where the data already lives. After we discover data, one of the things that's really, I think, uh, becoming more and more common these days is not just working with a single uh, source of data, but the need to integrate across multiple data sources. Uh, it's, it's really true to say that the environmental sciences, like many other parts of science, have really entered this era of big data. I mean, there's definitely areas of, in environmental sciences that are still data limited, but there's remarkably uh, many areas where the amount of data is growing uh, quite rapidly, um, and things that we couldn't measure before, we have come up with new ways of measuring. Um, there's this nice uh, book a while back that really kind of thought about uh, this era of big data as really a fourth paradigm in how we do science as a whole. So just a cha fundamental change in the way we do science, where you know, science originally started out as a purely empirical process of describing nature, 
and then it moved on to a, a theoretical perspective where we use models to try to generalize our understanding. This is what, you know, things like Newton's laws. Uh, then it moved in the last few decades into a more computational uh, approach where we do a lot of simulating of processes. But a lot of that uh, you know, era of simulating data was often done when the, the simulated processes were done in a data limited uh, capacity. We had a greater capacity to do compute than we had to do observation. Uh, and now we're in an era where we have uh, this kind of broad perspective of this ability to do computation and simulation and data collection all at increasingly large volumes. Uh, and the questions now are trying to find uh, the information in increasing large amounts of, of data and to digest it down rather than being limited by our ability to uh, collect it. So that leads us to this you know, kind of last phase of, of the data life cycle, which is data analysis, where we do things about how we harmonize our data, uh, how we visualize the data, the statistics we do, the model data comparisons we do with it, and the interpretation of that data. And these, these two figures here are actually uh, Reverend Bayes and, and Fisher, who are kind of the, the founders of the two most prominent schools of thought and, and statistics, which we'll learn more about uh, this semester. Also note that uh, this is a cycle where you know, very often some of these analyses will highlight deficiencies in our understanding or deficiencies in our monitoring approaches that will help us identify uh, what new what data needs to be collected next. So, so the scientific method itself is one that, you know, when we resolve questions, it often leads to new questions and a bit more refined questions uh, where the, the best science is driven by our, our most recent analyses. 